morning, and welcome to First Presbyterian Church. It is a joy to be together today to worship our God. At First Presbyterian, we record worship attendance digitally. After this service, you'll get a text to record your attendance. If you'd like to receive that text in the future, please fill out the visitor information section on the back of your bulletin and throw it in the offering plate uh, as you leave today. This is the last 830 service uh, of the semester. So thank you all for making the 830 service such a success this year. We are not going to meet again during the 830 service until the first Sunday of August. Next week is going to be Memorial Day. There will be no Sunday school hour or uh, 830 service. Today is the end of the Sunday school semester. In June, there's going to be a four week Sunday school class uh, where Pastor Bo and I will be teaching some Christian biographies. So all middle school, high school, and adults are welcome to that one class. That'll be downstairs in the fellowship hall. And there will also be Sunday school for our children available in June. But thank you all for making the 830 service such a success this year. Uh, we will resume the 830, and we will need you back to populate the 830 and build some momentum in the 830 service uh, the first Sunday of August. Please take a moment today uh, to catch up on the calendar and announcements page. Vacation Bible School is coming up. We do need decorators, snack makers, and a team of men to help with VBS kickoff on Sunday, June 5th. Please take a look at those VBS needs and consider how you can serve our children's ministry as Karen Lewis and her team prepare a really exciting week of play and learning about Jesus. Uh, that is for students up to rising fifth graders. Please register your children, your grandchildren, anybody you think uh, would benefit from that week. Our church committees will meet on the evening of June 13 from 5.15 to 6 p.m. to work on growing Christians and spreading the gospel. If you are one of are on one of those committees, please mark your calendars. Speaking of growing Christians and spreading the gospel, our women's Bible study meets on Tuesday nights this summer at 6.30 p.m. The first meeting will be held on May 31st at the home of Margaret White. Uh, if you are a guy and you hear that announcement and you say, I want a Bible study, I want to dig into God's Word, hasn't God revealed himself from heaven? Shouldn't I study it? Yes. He's revealed himself even for men. There's a men's Bible study every week at 6.45 a.m. here at the church on Monday mornings. Uh, there's a youth kickoff for the summer schedule on June 1st. First, that is from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. And this morning, the beautiful sanctuary flowers are given to the glory of God and in celebration of the baptism of Mally Kate Evans, which will be in our 1030 service, by her loving parents, Andrew and Hannah Evans. Now, let's turn our attention to the Lord so that we can worship Him. Good morning. Good to see you today. Our call to worship is from Psalm 46, and it's in your bulletin as a responsive call to worship. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, Though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surging. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. We're about to sing a hymn that uh, may be unfamiliar to you. Uh, hymn number 656, if you want to go ahead and turn there. Uh, written by Martin Luther. Martin Luther we think of as the father of the Protestant Reformation, and we think of him as a great preacher, a great theologian, a Bible translator, but many people don't know he was also a great musician and wrote a number of hymns and put some hymns to new tunes, which is something that we've, uh, we sing quite often here at First Pres is old hymns to new tunes. Well, it was Luther's determination during the Protestant Reformation to restore worship to the Reformed Church. And his most famous hymn is A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And it's based on Psalm 46 that we just uh, used for our call to worship. Luther's awareness of our intense struggle with Satan on a daily basis motivated him in his hymn writing. And in difficulty and in danger, Luther would often resort to this hymn, and he would say to his associate, Come, Philip, let us sing the 46th Psalm. So let us stand and sing the 46th Psalm from hymn number 656, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Our helper, he amid the 
country. Last Sunday morning uh, in Laguna Niguel, California, there was a church shooting. I took note of that being a pastor. I did not realize till the next day that someone that I knew was shot and killed. And that was Dr. John Chang. I don't know if you saw the story about the Geneva Presbyterian Church and the Taiwanese Presbyterian Church that meets it at Geneva Presbyterian Church. But when I was in Marshall, Texas, there was a young man who was in our youth group and came to our church quite often named John Chang. And John was a, the only believer in his family. And John led his entire family to Christ. Imagine that as a junior or senior in high school. He went on to Baylor University and then med school and was a physician in sports medicine, family practitioner in Laguna de Niguel. He was not a member of the Taiwanese Presbyterian Church but he went to take his mother last Sunday, and that was the only reason he was there. Yet we know that God had John there, because when the shooter had already wounded several people, John charged the shooter, tackled him, and then was shot and succumbed to his own injuries. And then they were able to succumb the shooter and take the perpetrator down. I tell you that to say that John Chang was a hero, he should be given the Presidential Medal of Freedom, but regardless of whether he is, I know that now he is in the presence of the Lord Jesus, worshiping him as his one and only Savior. Let us pray to that God that we trust him and believe in today. Father God, we thank you for this hour of worship. We praise you that you are our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. And in this world filled with devils, we praise you, Lord, for your cover of protection over us, and yet, Lord, we understand that they can kill the body, but they cannot, cannot kill the soul and take away our salvation. So I praise you, Lord, for my friend John, for his sacrifice of his life, for his mom and those parishioners who saved so many lives last week. And we thank you, Lord, for that. Today, as we worship you, help us to not take life for granted, but to give you thanks and praise for this day that you have given us to give you praise and worship and to study your word and to glory in the cross and the gospel. 
how we praise you, Lord Jesus, for your presence. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please be seated. Just, just as the Lord had John Chang exactly where he was intended to be, the Lord has each of us exactly where we are intended to be, and God is making a great name for himself in this world. And one of the ways that God shows his existence in this world is the ever-present voice of the human conscience. Every single one of us has a voice in our heads that says that people should be treated a certain way, that people should be spoken to a certain way, that people should live a certain way. The key word that we all have running through our heads all day, every day, is should. And we might not agree on how people should live, but we can all agree that in the back of our minds, there's a voice telling us that there is a way that people should live. Sometimes we live up to it, sometimes we don't. To say it in biblical terms, we all have a deep sense that there is some sort of law that everyone should be obeying. And in our honest moments, we can admit to ourselves that we do not even live up to the law that we tell ourselves is there. So what does this teach us? Christians have said for a long time that there are two things we can learn from this. The first is that if there is a law, then we all sense there must be a lawmaker. So think about it in our culture. Think about those onesies that say raise nice humans, right? It's a should statement. You should be raising nice humans. Well, why should I be raising nice humans? Or think about bumper stickers that say tolerate. You better be tolerating. Why should I be tolerating? Well, the reality is if there is a should, if there is a law, if there is a way we should live, then that means that someone who made us must have determined the way that we should live. So the first is that if there is a law, there must be a lawmaker. If the universe wasn't designed with some sort of way things should be, then why are we so confident that there's a way that things should be? Second, if I cannot live up to my own standards of how a person should behave, then why should I be surprised that I can't live up to God's standards? The reality is all of us have a voice in our heads that say there's a way people should live and we don't even live up to our own standards. So to take a moment and do something like what we're doing today, to gather and set time aside to think deeply about God and to think deeply about ourselves, we pretty quickly have to come to the honest admission that we fall short of his standards. And we are in need of someone to reconcile us to God. To think about God is to think about someone higher than ourselves. To think about ourselves is to think of someone lower than God. And we are in desperate need to be made right with God. And so this morning is your soul telling you about your need to be made right with God. Have you been honest with him about the things that you should not have done or the things you should not have thought or the things you should not have said? To confess our sins to God is to confess our need of God to forgive our sins. And to help us do that this morning, we're going to read and pray together the corporate confession of sin as it's printed in this morning's bulletin. Please pray with me. Almighty God and loving Father, we thank you for placing us in covenant relationships in homes and families and friendships. Forgive us for taking our vows and promises lightly. Forgive us for the breakdown of family life, for misdirected love, for failing to give time to our families, for failing to teach and live by your values, for neglecting our children. Bless the marriages in this place. Bless the relationships we share in this church body. Forgiveness, dear Father for the lack of commitment to you and to one another. Jesus, our heavenly brother, teach us every day to love and serve, to cherish and protect those with whom we live and with whom we worship. In your name we pray, amen. Now please take a moment to confess your own sins silently before the Lord. Lord, thank you for providing Jesus Christ to reconcile sinners to yourself. We thank you for this grace in which we now stand. We marvel at your great love. That you so loved the world that you gave your only son, so that whoever believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, you did not send the son into the world to be condemned by the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. So thank you, Lord, for this great mercy. And thank you that we can come to you, Lord, praying as you have taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand as we continue to give thanks to our God for this great forgiveness, singing hymn number 279, There Is a Redeemer.
Sydney. It's beautiful. All right, please take your Bibles if you have a Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 2. We're continuing the series that was begun on uh, Mother's Day, the Christian family. <clears throat> I told my wife um, last week was our anniversary and we were recovering from COVID on our anniversary. Still got to celebrate, but um, I told her, I said, look, if I'd known I was gonna be locked in with you for over a week, the last thing in the world I would preach on is marriage. <laughs> she agreed. So the Christian family, part two, and the title is, and they lived, dot, dot, dot. Uh, Genesis 2, starting at verse 18, my sources include Philip Eveson's uh, commentary on Genesis, the book of origins, Stephen Cole's studies, God's design for marriage, a uh, book by Wayne Max, Strengthening Your Marriage, and a book by Dennis Guernsey, um, The Family Covenant. So, and they live. Let's stand together for the reading of God's word. Genesis 2, we'll start reading at verse 18. This is the detail of creation of woman after man. This is the word of God. Verse 18, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the, in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this, your word, and thank you for the authority behind this word, Lord, that you have written this for us. And so I pray for those married here today and for those that will be one day married, that you will bless this, this time that we study your word together and give us grace and understanding, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. You know, most of us like fairy tales. Uh, we may not read them too often these days, unless you maybe read them to children or grandchildren like I do. But if I were to take a poll, I would guess that your favorite fairy tales, like mine, are those that end like this. And they lived happily ever after. And why do we like that? I mean, because everyone loves a happy ending, right? I mean, I, I'm the same way in movies. If, if a movie doesn't end right, doesn't end happy, I'm like, and I just wasted two hours, you know? What in the world? So the problem with fairy tales, though, is no one ever goes back, say, five, ten years later to sort out and, and check out what's happened since it all started and to see how it played out happily ever after. Well, as we continue our look at marriage and the family, I want us to look at the scripture to see what God has intended. And because in the beginning, it was God's design in marriage that everyone would live happily ever after. But it didn't work out that way. And maybe it hasn't worked out that way for you either. What is it that God intended when he created marriage? Think about that. And as a matter of fact, he didn't have to come up with marriage. He could have made us all just friends which might be stranger than the TV show, if you remember that show, but he didn't do that because he had a purpose in marriage. And in this second installment of the series, I want us to look at the scriptures so that we can see what that purpose is. So once again, from our text, Genesis 2, verse 24. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Verse 24 applies the principles of the first marriage in described in verses 22 and 23, it, it really describes that to every subsequent marriage. And I believe that this statement is the only statement in Scripture that God thought important enough to repeat four times. 
four times. He made it once in the Old Testament here in Genesis and then three times in the New Testament. So that was one time before the fall and then three times after the fall of mankind. So this is God's marital purpose for perfect man and for sinful mankind. And our text today is God's all-time blueprint for a good marriage. So in this statement, I think there are several very important lessons in this passage of Scripture. So let's look at them one at a time. First of all, and if you're following the outline, it will help you to stay with me. Husbands and wives are to leave, to leave their fathers and their mothers. All right, so what does it mean to leave your parents? It certainly doesn't mean that you're to abandon them or to divorce them or anything like that. It doesn't really mean you're supposed to disregard them. Furthermore, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have some sort of geographical distance from your parents, like move far and far away from them, although sometimes that might not be a bad idea. It was the late George Burns who once said, happiness is a large, loving, caring, close-knit family in another city. Now look, it is possible to leave your father and mother and still live next door. So I will give you that. And at the same time, it's also possible to live a thousand miles away from your parents and still not leave them. So to leave your parents means that your relationship to your parents has to change. How? Well, it means you must establish an adult relationship with them. It means you must be more concerned about your spouse's opinions than your parents. It means you must not be dependent on your parents for approval, for assistance, or for counsel. It's not bad to get their counsel, but you must not be dependent on them. You must eliminate any bad attitudes towards your parents, which means the emotional ties that you sometimes have, and you don't allow your parents to run down your mate behind his or her back. God did not create a father and a mother for Adam. He didn't create a child, but a wife for Adam. That was the helper suitable for him. And our text says a man must leave father and mother in order to establish a one flesh relationship with his wife. This means that the marriage relationship becomes the primary relationship, not the parent-child relationship. The parent-child relationship must be altered before the marriage relationship can be established. So what am I saying? I'm saying that the cord has to be cut. This doesn't mean abandoning parents or cutting ties, cutting off contact with them. It does mean that a person needs enough emotional maturity to break away from dependence upon his parents in order to enter into marriage. This also means that the marriage relationship must be built primarily on commitment, not on feelings of romantic love. When I told my dad in college that I was getting married, <clears throat> That was an interesting conversation. We were, I was a junior, almost a senior in college. I said, Dad, I'm gonna get married. He said, why are you gonna do that? I said, because I love her. He says, yeah, but one day you gotta eat. <laughs> you know what he meant. I know what he meant. But anyway, he thought it was all focused on romantic love. But did you notice in our passage that love is not mentioned in Genesis 2? It's not really overtly mentioned. But I do think the romance of love is evident in Adam's poetic outburst in verse 23. When God made the woman, the man said in verse 23, this, not all the animals, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. I mean, I can just imagine Adam shouting, she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. So I think romantic love is important, but... The foundation of marriage is commitment of the will. Believe it or not, it is your commitment to one another, not your love for one another, that will hold your marriage together. I'll say that again. It is your commitment to one another by an act of your will, not your love for one another, that will hold you together through the difficulties that you will ultimately face in your marriage. That's the difference in Christian marriage. It is based on a covenant before God not a marriage contract with the state. Okay, so the first lesson, husbands and wives are to leave their fathers and mothers. Second lesson is this, husbands and wives are to cleave, cleave to one another. All right, cleave is a, a word that means 
Uh, to glue, it means to join together, to stick. And the Hebrew word for cleave is actually more expressive. It, it goes on to say that by pulling apart the two, you're going to hurt both parties. It's going to hurt in terms of, imagine something you glued together and you decide, I, I didn't want to do that. You want to pull it apart. Well, it's going to cause damage to both pieces. So, again, today, couples a lot of times begin their married life, sadly, with the thought that if the marriage doesn't work out, they can always get a divorce. That's a really bad idea of how to enter into a marriage. You really need to enter into marriage with the thought, this is going to be forever. Um, in other words, divorce is not God's primary intention for marriage. And any of you that have been divorced, you understand that, I'm sure. The Bible says that God, when he instituted marriage, intended it to be a permanent relationship. Malachi 2.16 is a passage that a lot of people don't like to hear because they think it, it means something that it doesn't mean. The prophet Malachi in Malachi 2 says, I hate divorce. And this is God speaking through the prophet Malachi. I hate divorce. A lot of people take that passage to mean, I hate divorced people. That is not what the passage says. So listen to Mark chapter 10. If you'll turn with me to the New Testament, Mark chapter 10. This is where Jesus was confronted by the Pharisees, the religious leaders, and asked about divorce. Mark chapter 10, starting at verse 2. It says some Pharisees came and, and tested Jesus by asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Jesus replied, well, what did Moses command you? They said Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Jesus replied, it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, and here's the quote again from Genesis 2, for this reason, the man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. That's the cleaving part. And the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. That's a powerful passage, isn't it? So again, I'll say it again, a, a good marriage is based more on commitment than feelings or even animal attraction. According to Malachi 2.14 and Proverbs 2, um, verse 17, marriage is an irrevocable covenant to which we are permanently bound. And in this society, I don't think we understand the idea or the concept of covenant. We understand the idea of a contract, but not the idea of a covenant. So in your outline, you might want to jot this down. A covenant that is a marriage covenant means a promise or a commitment binding two parties to one another unconditionally. I'll say it again. A commitment, this is a covenant, binding two parties together to one another unconditionally. Now on the other hand, a contract, a contract is defined as a legal relationship in which two people bind themselves together based on mutual conditions and or performance. Say that again. A contract is a legal relationship in which two people bind themselves together based on mutual conditions and or performance. Contracts involve the principle of quid pro quo, that is something for something. Now, don't miss this next statement. It is unhealthy to think of marriage as a contract. You really should never think about your contract of marriage. And Dennis Guernsey uh, makes a great statement in his book when he says this, when my love for my spouse is predicated on his or her performance and not on my commitment, when that happens, resentments build, confusion rules, and the relationship becomes infused with anxiety. Did you hear that? When my love for my spouse is predicated on his or her performance and not on my commitment, when that happens, resentments build, confusion rules, and the relationship becomes infused with anxiety. Now, I'm going to give you a tough example about all this thing of covenant. Our example for covenantal kind of commitment is our God. Our God is a promise-keeping God. If you read the Old Testament, you will notice that the Israelites, God's chosen people, they wandered all over the map, not, not literally, but, but not just literally, but morally also. They were continually breaking their covenant with God. But God never once gave up on them. I mean, he was disheartened 
for sure, even to the point of wanting to destroy them at times, but he didn't destroy them because he kept his promise to them. And in the face of disappointment, in the face of a marriage that seems to fall short of someone else's marriage, it's natural to have thoughts and fantasies of wanting to get out of the marriage to be free of the promise. So what do you do when your spouse fails you like Israel failed God? I'm reminded of the story of Hosea in the Old Testament. You may not know much about the book of Hosea, but God chose Hosea and his wife. Her name really troubles me. You remember her name? Gomer. Yeah, I, and I'm an Andy Griffith fan, and I really have a hard time saying the word Gomer as a biblical name, so I'm gonna call her Gomer. Okay, is that all right with you? I just cannot call her Gomer, okay? All I can see is that guy on Andy Griffith, Shazayim, you know, I, I, can't, I can't do it. So anyway, God chose Hosea and his wife, Gomer, to serve as a metaphor of the relationship between God and Israel. God instructs Hosea, listen to this, he instructs Hosea to take to himself, quote, a promiscuous woman and have children with her. That's Hosea 1 verse 2. It's right at the beginning of the book. It says literally, take to yourself a wife of harlotry. God tells Hosea that he wanted Hosea's relationship with Gomer to reflect what it means to be a covenant people. Gomer was a prostitute and would continue to be a prostitute. We are told in Hosea chapter 3 of Gomer's continued unfaithfulness. So listen to what it says in Hosea 3. Verse 1. Listen to what God says to Hosea. The Lord said to me, Go, show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods. So that God's commitment to Israel is the model, if you will, of what a marriage covenant is to be. And I'll be the first to say, there are exceptions to this model. I mean, one exception would be if you find yourself in a physically abusive situation. But in the majority of marriages, there's not this exception, just unhappiness. And I'll tell you, when you commit yourself to another person in marriage, in some ways, the wedding vows would be better stated and actually a lot more realistic if they said this. I take you to be my lawfully wedded spouse with the full knowledge that you are weak as I am weak, that you will be unfaithful as I will be, if not in actuality, then in fantasy, that there will be times when you will disappoint me as I will disappoint you. But in spite of all this, I commit myself to love you, knowing your weaknesses and knowing my own. What I'm saying is if, if there's no commitment, no covenant, then there will be no will to go on. But if there is a covenant, then you can persevere by the grace of God when everything inside of you says quit. Covenant means that not only am I committed to you and to me, but also that when things go wrong, I can trust God to breathe new life into a relationship that appears to be dead. Marriage means that a husband and wife enter into a relationship for which they accept full responsibility and in which they commit themselves to each other regardless of the problems they face. Marriage means you and your mate are a couple. You're indivisible, you're undivided, you're one. And that's what cleave is all about. So leave, cleave, and then the third lesson is husband and wives are to experience in marriage the reality of what they are in principle, and that is total oneness, total oneness. And I don't think I even have to tell you this, but total oneness is not easily achieved in marriage. Why? Because there are two people in marriage. You know, you always look for somebody compatible, right? And really the first thing that you should be told if you do have premarital counseling is you are not compatible. You're not compatible. You need to know that from the get-go because you're not. Because you're a sinner and your mate-to-be is also a sinner. And you've got, you have two sinners trying to come together 
and, and it just it causes conflict. I didn't realize when I got married how natural and normal conflict is. It was shocking to me. I really believed in the happily ever after. And yet, by the grace of God, there can be the happily ever after, but there's going to be a lot of conflict in your life if you're married. And, you know, those that tell me we've never had an argument. I, I hear that in premarital counseling. I, we've never had an argument. I said, well, then go have one. Please, go have one. Because you're going to have one. And I can think up something that you can argue about if you don't have anything to argue about. I mean, you may have never thought about it, but the fact that there is male and female is a reflection of who God is. The fact that there is maleness and femaleness, that there is diversity and unity, is a reflection of God's image in us. So God created us male and female, and he created us for unity, for us to be one. A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. That is God's dream for marriage. But as you and I know, the story in our text does not have a happy ending either. You know how I know? Because I'm married. I've been married a long time. Donna and I have had disagreements over consequential and inconsequential things. And when that happens, there's just not a lot of unity between us, which is what happened between Adam and Eve which is also why you and I struggle in our own marriages, because you have to go from Genesis 2 to Genesis 3, which we will look at next time. When Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis 3, and in the process destroyed their oneness, God punished them, pronouncing curses upon them for their sins against him. Yet in the midst of those curses in Genesis 3, God promises that a redeemer will come, which is why I wanted us to sing that middle hymn, There is a Redeemer. Jesus Christ, the Lord. That Redeemer who was predicted to come, who would restore our sense of oneness, is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that you don't miss this next statement, I want you to repeat it after I say it. Whether in marriage or in singlehood, Jesus Christ, that's your two blanks, Jesus Christ is the key to your happily ever after. So please say it with me, would you? Whether in marriage or in singlehood, Jesus Christ is the key to your happily ever after. Let's say it one more time. Whether in marriage or in singlehood, Jesus Christ is the key to your happily ever after. You know what the biggest fallacy I think in marriage is? Expecting your spouse to meet your needs. That's the way I went into marriage. This is the one who's going to meet all my needs. Did you know that no one can actually meet all of your needs? Well, there is one. And his name is Jesus Christ. When you seek in another person or in another individual your needs to be met, you will be very disappointed, ultimately. But when you look to Jesus Christ to meet your needs, he will fulfill you in a way that you could never imagine. He will see you through the difficulties by his grace as you keep your eyes upon him. And as we close, I want you to think about what I would consider to be God's remedy for couples who lack oneness and unity in their marriage. And that remedy is common ground. Common ground. Don't miss this. Since we are created in the image of God, as our text tells us, we are really more alike than we are different. We make much progress toward unity when we step onto common ground. We regress away from unity when we focus on our differences. And I think that's the thing that my wife and I would say to each of you is that we learned as we got married and got to know each other better that we were very different. And we had to learn how to deal with those differences and to find common ground. The greatest common bond that we had was our relationship to Jesus Christ and our faith in Christ, our calling to ministry. All of that was wonderful, but it was a lot of other differences, differences that we still deal with because we're married and we live together every single day. So, but when you focus on the differences, conflict is inevitable, which brings us to our verse of the week, which is Philippians 2, verses 1 through 2. Philippians 2, 1 through 2, and I'd like you to read that out loud with me if you would. 
Philippians 2, 1 through 2 at the bottom of your outline in the bulletin. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love for us. And Lord, we thank you for the forgiveness of our sins, even the sin of divorce. We thank you that there is forgiveness there. And for those who have been divorced at some point, we pray for your peace and comfort over that divorce. And we pray for your hope for the future and for your grace as they live their lives now. And Father, thank you for being a God who loves us so much that you did not want us to be alone. But you've given us a companion for life through our wives or our husbands. And so we pray for the marriages in this place and pray for your grace, Lord, for your mercy, for that common ground of acceptance for the love that's unconditional, just as you loved Israel. And Lord, I pray that you would be our pattern. But Lord, most of all, I pray that you would be our rock, our refuge, our strength, because we are weak. We cannot do this on our own. We need your help, Lord. And so we thank you. We thank you for the abundance of your Holy Spirit's presence in us. And may you quicken that presence in us, Lord, as we seek to honor you in our lives and our homes. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In closing, let's stand and sing His mercy is more. It's in the bulletin.
You know, Martin Luther said that there's nothing, and Michael, you agree with this, there's nothing like music. There's nothing like music to stay in your mind and in your heart. You know that song that you hear and you just want to get it out of your head? Well, here's one we just sang. Keep it in your head as you leave today. Hope you'll remember this song that we sang and uh, remember his mercy is more. Um, tonight is uh, First Church 101, which is our membership class. It's also for those who just want to check us out and find out more about our church. It's from 5 o'clock to 7.30 or earlier uh, in the E201 classroom in the back of our educational wing. Right across from Comcast, you park in the back parking lot. So if you'd like to sign up, have not signed up, please let me know after the benediction. Now may God's grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you and those you love this day, henceforth, and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.